Turn in your Bibles to the Epistle of Paul to the Romans, chapter 8. Romans, chapter 8. Good to see all of you this evening, and we want to welcome our internet congregation who are tuning in with us tonight, and we are still studying this subject of grace, of grace. Romans, chapter 8. And verse 28, we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he, his Son, might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called, and whom he called, he also justified, and whom he justified, he also glorified. What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifies. Let us pray. Our Father, we thank you for this time together. I ask you to bless us and illuminate our minds that we might understand this wonderful doctrine revealed in your word for your people. We pray in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ for his sake. Amen. All right, everybody's familiar now with the uh, points that I'm using, the acrostic G for goodness, R for righteousness, A for atonement, C for covenant, and E for election and everyone that is thirsty. We're de dealing with the first part of that now. The election, God's Grace is a manifestation of his goodness to us, which could not be shown at the expense of God's righteousness. And so he satisfied the demands of righteousness, which is a revelation of his own nature, through the atonement, the atonement rendered by our Lord Jesus Christ. And that was planned before the foundation of the world in a covenant between the Father and the Son and the Spirit, by which the Father chose a number which no man can number of every kindred, tribe, nation, generation. The Spirit calls them. The Son died for them. The Spirit calls them, uh, reveals the gospel to them, and saves them. Now this we call election, and I mentioned to you last time, it's mentioned 27 times directly in the Bible. Elect or election is mentioned 27 times. It's mentioned 51 times with its correlative. So a correlative is a word or concept that has a mutual relationship with another word or concept. In other words, for example, if we think about the sovereignty of God, and we read, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. It doesn't use the word election there, but it's certainly implying God's will as sovereign. Now, let me share some passages with you. Time will not allow us to look at every one of them, but let me share them with you. And if you have a, you should bring your little notepad and take some notes and you go over these things later. Jesus Christ is called elect in Isaiah 42, verse 1. Behold my servant, whom I uphold, mine elect, in whom my soul delights, I have put my spirit upon him, and he shall bring forth judgment to the Gentiles. I, Isaiah 42, 1. That's our Lord Jesus Christ. 
2 Peter 2, 6, it is contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect and precious, and he that believes on him shall not be confounded. 1 Peter 2, in verse 6. The Bible says that Israel is an elect nation among the nations. Isaiah 45, 4. For Jacob my servant's sake, and Israel mine elect. I have even called thee by thy name. I have surnamed thee, though thou hast not known me. Isaiah 65, 22. They shall not build and another inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat. For as the days of a tree are the days of my people, and mine elect shall long enjoy the work of their hands. Isaiah 65, 22. Those are passages that refer to Israel being elect among the nations. Then the Bible speaks of individuals in Israel that are elect. Isaiah 65, 9, I will bring forth a seed out of Jacob and out of Judah, an inheritor of my mountains, and mine elect shall inherit it, and my servants shall dwell there. Romans 11, 1, I say then, has God cast away his people? God forbid, for I also am an Israelite. This is Paul writing, of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not cast away his people which he foreknew. Do you not know how the scripture says to Elijah when he made intercession to God against Israel? And he said, Lord, they have killed thy prophets. They have digged down thine altars and I'm left alone and they seek my life. What did the answer of God say unto him? I have reserved to myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. Even so, at this present time, there is also a remnant, a remnant in Israel, elect according to the election of grace. That's, a, that's a Romans 11, uh, 1 through uh, 4. You can also read in uh, Romans 9, 6 through 16. There's a, there's a seed, an elect seed within the elect nation. The Bible speaks in 1 Timothy 5, 21 of elect angels. Two-thirds of the angelic host uh, or a third of them fell, rebelled against God. The ones that didn't rebel were called the elect angels. The end of the world, the Lord Jesus says in Matthew 24, except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved, but for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. Matthew 24, 22. Matthew 24, 24, there shall arise false Christ, false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Matthew chapter 24, verse 31, He will send forth His angels with the great sound of a trumpet. They shall gather together His elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. Matthew 24, 31. Luke 18, Jesus talks about His people crying to Him and asking them for deliverance and things get worse and worse and worse. And He says this, And shall not God avenge His own elect which cry Day and night unto him, though he bear along with him. That's Luke 18 and uh, verse 7. Then we read <clears throat> about the sovereignty of God. We just read it, Romans 8, 33. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It's God that justifies. We read in Romans 9, 11, The children not born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand. Not of works, but of him that calls. Romans 11, 5, there is at this present time a remnant according to the election of grace. And in Romans chapter 11, if you'd like to turn to Romans 11, since you're in uh, the epistle of Paul to the Romans, and there's some pew Bibles there in front of you, and get you a pew Bible. Romans 11, Paul uh, tells us this. <clears throat> I read part of it a moment ago. In Romans 11, in verse 28, he's talking about people, the, ele or, or the elect remnant within the elect nation of Israel. 
And so in Romans 11 and verse uh, 7, what then Israel, the nation of Israel, has not obtained that which he seeks for, but the election has obtained it, and the rest were blinded. Those within the nation that God chose obtained it, and the rest were blinded. We have an admonition to believers in Colossians chapter 3, verse 12. Put on therefore as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, and long-suffering. 1 Thessalonians 1, 4, brethren, know your election of God. 2 Peter 1, 10, make your calling and election sure. One of the reasons that Paul continued to endure, though he was stoned several times, beaten several times, and shipwrecked, and he got up and go back in the city and kept preaching, one of the reasons he did that, he says, in uh, 2 Timothy 2.10, he said, I endure all things for the elect's sake. I'm on the trail of the elect. And then in Titus chapter 1, verse 1, Paul writes to Titus about the faith of God's elect and the acknowledging of the truth which is after godliness in hope of eternal life which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. Then in 1 Peter 5, 13, you read about the church in Babylon elected together with you. And then in 2 John chapter 1, verse 1, verse 13, you read about the elect lady and her children and the children of thy elect sister, greet thee. Now that's just some of the references in the Bible. Uh, the Bible is full, 27 direct uh, references to elect and election. Now you should know, people in this church should know that the word theology is a combination of two words, theos, T-A-T-O-S, which means God, and logos, or logos, L-O-G-O-S, which means word. So theology means word of God, okay? So what we're doing when we study the Bible, we are studying theology. Now, I've mentioned this to you a while back. That's theology, word of God. What is a theodicy? Now, look today, try to find a board. I'm going to get a chalkboard or a marker lock board or something that I can put up here and put some of these terms up here for you. Theodicy, T-H-E-O-D-I-C-Y, a theodicy is an argument that seeks to justify some action of God to the mind of man. For example, in look in Romans chapter 9, and we covered this last week, Romans chapter 9 and verse 14, where Paul says, What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? Now, why would Paul ask that question? He would ask that question because if you understand what he's saying, you're going to think that there's unrighteousness with God. Because he has said here that God, for example, he gives an exa example here of Rebekah, verse 10, who had conceived by Isaac. Isaac, of course, was the promised son to Abraham. Abraham, uh, he wasn't born to Abraham until Abraham was 100 years old. Okay? And he, he says right here in verse 11 of Romans 9, the children were not even born. They hadn't done any good and they hadn't done any evil. That the purpose of God according to election might stand. So God did what he did it that way so you can see that his purpose according to election might stand not of works but of him that calls. So the question is, is there unrighteousness with God? He goes on to say in verse 15 that he has mercy on whom he will. He has compassion on whom he will. He says it's not man's will, verse 16. It's not man's work, verse 16. It's of God that shows mercy. Then he says in verse 18, he has mercy on whom he will, and he hardens whom he will. And then he has this objection in verse 19. Well, okay then, you're going to say to me, Paul says, why does he find fault? For who has resisted his will? Now Paul says here to me, in my thinking, 
that the secret determinative will of God, whatever he has purposed, cannot be overthrown. Now people argue and say, well, man's got a free will. Yes, you got a will. It's not free, though. It's subject to your appetites. It's subject to this world. It's subject to all kinds of things. It's going to be subject to death. You can will to live to your 150, but you are not going to be able to live to 150 in most cases. <laughs> Joe Turner, have y'all heard from Joe? Anybody heard from Brother Turner? His mother was 99 years old, and he told me, oh, not this past Sunday, but Sunday was a week ago, that she taught Sunday school at 99. And they said it was one of the best lessons that they'd ever heard. Her Sunday school class said. And Lynn and I met Mrs. Turner when she was probably in her late, Early 40s, I'd say, in her early 40s. So we've known her a long, a long time. And, and, and then uh, uh, Wendell Mitchell's mother, you know how old she is? She's 101 years old. 101. He goes still and tries to, tries to take care of her. So the Lord determines those things. He determines how long are we gonna, we going to live? He determines our salvation. He determines a lot of things. Now, here's the question. Why does God do things like that? <laughs> Why does he wait till Abraham is 100 years old to give him a son? Just so people will have to say, God did it. That's why he does it that way. He does it so that there's no question about it. That if he, You have to say, God did it. You can't say, man did it. You can't say, he was lucky. You can't say he was an exception. You have to say God did it. So the Bible does teach election. I'm spending quite a bit of time here on this doctrine of election because I don't want you to misunderstand. We've had people who have misunderstood doc the doctrine of election. But I do want you to understand that the Bible does teach the doctrine of election. Now, when we talk about the kind of election it is, we use the term unconditional. And I looked at that last week. The word is eklektos, E-K-L-E-K-T-O-S, eklektos, which means to pick out or to choose or to select from out of. So we've got the word ek, which means to gather or to pick out. Electos. God does elect. He does choose. Now, if people get upset about salvation, uh, this is why I have used this John chapter 6, verse 37 passage for the last three weeks. It says what? Anybody remember it? <laughs> All that the Father gives me shall come to me, and him that comes to me I will in no wise cast out. So if you have come to Christ, you have been given to Christ. And anyone who wants to come to Christ may come to Christ. The Bible doesn't say no man may come. The Bible says no man can come. And the word may is what? That is a word of permission. But can is a word of ability. Men have permission, but they don't have the ability. And this word elect and election used throughout the scripture, it is called unconditional to describe the kind of election that's set forth in scripture. And it's called under unconditional election because of the time it took place, which was before the foundation of the world. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 4, chosen in him before the foundation of the world. Revelation 13, 8, Revelation 17, 8, he was a lamb slain before the foundation of the world. 2 Timothy 1, 9, he has saved us and called us for the holy calling, according, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. 2 Thessalonians 2, 13, God has from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief in the truth. So it's called unconditional because of the time of it. Now, the nature of it is pure sovereign grace. And we're not going to really look at those passages again. We've already looked at them. John chapter 1, verse 12. As many as received him, to them he gave the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name which were born, not of the will of man, not of blood, but of God. Okay? 
So the nature of it is sovereign grace. John 1, 12 and 13, Romans 9, 9 through 13, Romans 9, 15, 16, and 18. The cause of it. The cause of it is totally within God. And I'm not going to go over what I've already gone over with you several over the years many times. Well, we're justified freely. Let's turn to Romans chapter 3. Let me just show you this passage. We've looked at this many, many, many times. Romans chapter 3 and verse 24. Being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. And I've told you that that word freely is the word D as in dog, O-R-E-A-N, Dorian. And it means without a cause. Freely is without a a cause. You're justified without a cause. The same word is used in John 15, 25, where Jesus says, they hated me without a cause. So the hatred for Jesus was without a cause as far as Jesus is concerned. There was no cause in Jesus as to why men should hate him. The cause was in the men who hated him. So when it comes to our salvation, there's no cause in us why he should justify us freely. The cause is in God. Okay, and that's what we see here in Romans 3, 24. So the cause of it, it is just, we're justified freely from gratuitous, from what we get our word gratuity, a free tip as we say, used of the Lord Jesus Christ to explain why men hate him and why we are justified. All right, now, we have other words that we could deal with. I'll just touch on them. We've got the word. Let's turn to Romans 8 again. Romans 8, verse 29. And we have this word, foreknow. Romans 8, 29. For whom he did foreknow. Now that's a word, prokonosko, P-R-O, pro, which means before, and gnosko has to do with knowing, G-I-N-O-S-K-O, prokonosko, to know beforehand, okay? Then the word foreknowledge in this, in this passage, I believe, let me see. The word foreknow here uh, has to do with uh, God knowing beforehand people. Now please notice that he says here, for whom he did foreknow, verse 29. So people say, well, God looked down through history and he saw what we would do, but it doesn't say for what he did foreknow. It has nothing to do with what he saw we would do. You know what he saw we would do? He saw in Romans chapter 3 that none seek God that there's none righteous, that there's none good, no, not one. That's what he saw. And if he had left us in that state, nobody would be saved. But this says, for whom he did foreknow. It has to do with a relationship. It has to do with God's sovereign plan. His determinate will bound up in his purpose to glorify himself through a people that he will bring to himself. Jesus said in Luke 22, 22, truly the Son of Man is going as it was determined. That word determined is the same word that we get the word foreordained from. The the death of Christ was foreordained. He told his disciples from the very beginning, I'm going to go to Jerusalem, I'm going to be crucified, I'm going to die, and the Father is going to raise me from the, uh, from the dead three days later. His, uh, his death was settled. His death was unchangeable. Acts chapter 2 and verse 23. His, his death was predestinated, pruherizo, the destiny determined beforehand. Acts 4.28, Romans 8.29 and 30. All of these things show us that God is on the throne, and that he does have a people, and that he's going to save them. What I want to show you, if I can, in the time we have left, is that there's no contradiction between the sovereignty of God 
and uh, the will of man or coming to Christ or wanting to be saved. The first uh, apology that I give you for that is that John 6, 37. The Holy Spirit inspired the word of God and he inspired there in that very same verse that the Father had given to the Son a, a, a people. All that the Father gives me shall come to me. Then he turns right around and says, He that comes to me, I will in no wise cast out. So the Holy Spirit sees no contradiction between the sovereignty of God and people coming freely coming to Christ. When you come to Christ, you come to Christ because you want to, but you want to because God has given you a want to. According to the scripture in Romans chapter 3 and many other passages of scripture, men do not seek God if left to themselves. Just like a lost sheep doesn't seek a shepherd. Uh, men have to be sought by the shepherd of souls. So all who believe the Bible, and I told you this last week, everybody that believes the Bible believes in election. They either believe that man elects God and then God elects man on what he saw that man would do, or they believe that God takes the initiative and uh, saves us. Now, some of these terms, that's why I need a board up here, you're not familiar with, so let me just briefly say a word about this. How many of you have heard of Pelagianism? Have you ever heard that term, Pelagianism? Many of you have. Pelagius believed that man, each person that's born in this world, is born basically in the same state that Adam was in before he sinned. So you're not born into the world a sinner. You're born uh, kind of in a neutral state, and uh, you may not be in a state of positive righteousness, but you're not born a sinner. And you can decide when you want to be saved and so on, and when you want to be, <laughs> be lost. Pelagianism uh, is exemplified in a lot of groups today. Beyond uh, Pelagianism, there's Arminianism. Uh, Jacob Arminius was a person who lived during the time and the days of John Calvin. And Jacob Arminius said, man is born a sinner and he, he does need the grace of God, but he in his spiritual death still retains complete sovereignty over his will. He still has a free will and he's able to choose or to reject God. So Pelagianism and Arminianism teach a conditional election, and then what's called Augustinianism, which was later called Calvinism, teaches an unconditional election. What does the Bible teach? God elected me because I first elected him. He chose me because I first chose him. Or I chose God because he first chose me. He elected me because I could not save myself. Which one of those is true? Well, we believe that the last one is true. Granted, the believer chooses the Lord and the believer is chosen of the Lord. The question is, which was the first choice? Which choice resulted from the other? Which was the cause and which was the effect? Is it true that God is careful only to elect those he foresees will elect themselves? Or has God sovereignly chosen his people according to his own will and good pleasure? According to the scripture, election is unconditional. That is, God chose his people apart from setting forth any conditions for them to meet because he did see what they were and he knew that they couldn't meet those conditions. And this wasn't done arbitrarily, and there are at least three reasons why God elected unconditionally. And this is what we'll have to stop here tonight when I get through with this. Number one, and I've already covered this, but let me cover it again. He elected unconditionally, first of all, because of what he knew. Now, how many of you know that the Romans 3 passage, to which I've referred several times tonight, Romans 3, beginning at verse 9, that says that there's uh, 
All that understand, none righteous, no, not one, verse 10. None that understand, verse 11. None that seek God, verse 11. All have gone out of the way, verse 12. They all become unprofitable. There's none that doeth good. Their throat's an open sepulcher. Goes all the way down to verse 18. There's no fear of God before their eyes. Where did the apostle Paul, who wrote these words, where did he get these words? He got it from Psalm 14. Psalm 14, where it says, The Lord looked down from heaven to see if there were any that did seek him. If there were any good, and he said, No, not one. And Paul is just quoting Psalm 14 in Romans chapter 3. What did God see? He saw that man was hopelessly lost. He saw that they are all going aside. They are all together become filthy. There's none that doeth good, no, not one. So the Lord knew from all eternity that men, if left alone, would never choose him. They would never seek him. And if anybody was going to be spared, the Lord had to do something for them. And so the Apostle Paul is quoting that psalm in Romans 3. So the Lord elected us because of what he saw. Okay? Secondly, because of God's great love and mercy. I have loved thee with an everlasting love, therefore with loving kindness have I drawn thee. When are when, uh, men willing? When are men willing? Psalm 110 verse 3, Thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power. John 6, 44, no man can come to me except the Father which has sent me draw him and I'll raise him up at the last day. So knowing the condition of man, knowing what man would do in time, the Lord therefore knew that man could not, would not meet any condition set forth. And so in sovereign mercy, he chose to set his love upon man unconditionally. That was the only way for anybody to be saved. All right, finally tonight, if you'll look at Romans 8, 29, one more time. Romans chapter 8, verse 29. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Now, many attempt to use this passage to prove conditional election, but it actually establishes the opposite. There are two general views regarding the meaning of the word foreknow in this passage in Romans 8, uh, 29. You all have your Bible, so you can read that for yourself. We read it a moment ago. Two general views. I've already mentioned them to you. The Armenian view and the Pelagian view. The Armenian and the Pelagian commentators maintain that Paul is saying that God predestinated the salvation those whom he knew would respond to his offer of grace. And when this, when this uh, is, is used, for example, let me, let me quote a man here named Frederick Godet, G-O-D-E-T. He says, in what respect did God thus foreknow them? They were foreknown as sure to fulfill the conditions of salvation, that is faith, so foreknown as his faith. So he says that God saw that they would believe and so he selected them. The first thing you need to know is what I've already pointed out is that in verse 29 he says, for whom he did foreknow. Not what he did foreknow, but whom. He's talking about per, uh, persons. The verse says nothing about God knowing something about particular individuals, what they would do and what they wouldn't do. But he says that God knew those individuals themselves. Foreknow could not have a reference to what the individuals under consideration would do because God knows what all men would do. Doesn't he? Doesn't God know what all men would do at all times? But all men are not justified. And all men are not glorified. All men are not called. So this means that God doesn't foreknow all men in the sense of these Armenians and uh, Pelagians. When the view is held that he foreknows what men will do, that verse makes no sense. If you read it that way, if you said, for what he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed in the image of his son, that verse makes no sense. 
God knows people. He has an intimate relationship with people. He foreknew people. So to foresee has reference to his knowing beforehand in a relationship, a relationship of love, of favor, uh, of election. In the immediate context here, the whole context is pushing the sovereignty of God in light of the fact that man is absolutely ruined. He's absolutely ruined. And if God did not save, no man could be saved. How could God choose on the basis of what he saw men would do without having respect to some? Now turn in, turn in your Bibles, I can quote this, Romans chapter 2, but I want you to see it. I can quote it, but I want you to see it. Romans chapter 2, what does verse 11 say? It said, there's no respect of persons with God. If the Lord was choosing people or some people on the basis of what he saw they would do, that would be violating Romans 2.11. He'd be having respect of persons when the Bible clearly says that he has no respect to persons. And then the Romans 3, 9 through 18 passage, how could God see that none would do good, none would repent, none would believe, none would understand, none would seek him, and at the same time see that they would choose him? That doesn't make sense. When we really get down to the brass tacks and we, we talk about the father of faith, the father of the faithful would be who? That would be Abraham. Abraham. How can you explain the salvation of Abraham? When his father was an idol maker, his father made gods and idols, and Abraham comes to know the one true and living God, you can only explain that if you believe that God himself came to Abraham and showed himself to Abraham and made himself known as the one true and living God to Abraham. How could God have foreseen Abraham would choose him when he didn't even know who God was? He couldn't have. He could not have chosen based upon what would or would not do because all men did was evil and none did good. And no man will call on God to be saved unless the Lord does something for them. Now when I say do something for them, I mean he makes all the arrangements. I mean he, he, he crosses your path with somebody that's a witness to you and then he blesses that witness and he opens, he works in your mind and in your heart and gives you an understanding of it. He does all, he does all of it. I'm sure you've heard and I have told you many times about Charles Spurgeon on the way to a church, certain church in London in the wintertime. I think he was 17 or 18 years old. And the, the weather, uh, because of the weather, he couldn't get what he wanted, and he just ducked into what was called a primitive Methodist church. And there were just a few people there, and the pastor didn't even make it because of the weather. And Spurgeon said an old deacon got up, and he took Isaiah 45, Look unto me, all the ends of the earth, for I am God, and there is none else. Look unto me and be saved. And the old deacon just kept saying, Look. He said, A baby can look. An idiot can look. Anybody can look. And Spurgeon said, he looked back at me. And he said, look, young man, look. And Spurgeon said, I looked until I thought I'd look my eyes out. And he said, I left that place exhilarated and full of joy and full of glory. But he said, later I started thinking, how did I, how did I get in there? Well, the weather, the weather put me in there. How was it that the, that the preacher wasn't there that Sunday? Well, the weather permitted him to do that. Who's in control of the weather? Well, God is. Well, how'd that old deacon be there? Well, how did he partic- pick that particular text? And he said, I, I saw that the Lord was behind it all. So, my dear friends, we need to preach the gospel, witness the gospel, tell people about the Lord Jesus Christ, and leave the consequences of it up to him. There is an election. His people are elect. It's a great mystery. People can do what they will 
and God will do what he will. Robert Haldane said, faith cannot be the cause of foreknowledge because foreknowledge is always before predestination and predestination is the effect of faith. That is, predestination causes and gives you, gives you faith. Now, last passage, Acts chapter 13, verse 48. Acts 13, 48. The disciples had a bit of a problem receiving Gentiles as brothers. And they came to understand that God was going to save the Gentiles and the Jews in the same way. Here in Acts chapter 13, Notice, first of all, verse 39. By him all that believe are justified from all things from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. All right? Now, Paul and Barnabas preached the gospel to these Jews, and they wouldn't receive it. They would not receive it. So look at verse 44. And the next Sabbath day came almost the whole city together to hear the word of God. But when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy and spake against those things which were spoken by Paul, contradicting and blaspheming. Trying to say the Bible doesn't teach that. Now remember, they didn't have a New Testament. They just had an Old Testament. Then Paul and Barnabas, verse 46, waxed bold and said it was necessary that the word of God should have been first spoken to you, but seeing you have put it off from you and judged yourselves unworthy to everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. For so hath the Lord commanded us, saying, I have set thee to be a light of the Gentiles, that thou shouldest be for salvation unto the ends of the earth. Now watch verse 48. And when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord, and as many as were ordained to eternal life believed. That's what it says. It doesn't say they were ordained after they believed. It says as many as were ordained to eternal life believed. And the word of the Lord, verse 49, was published throughout all the regions. Everywhere Paul and Peter went, they had opposition by the Jews. Because the Jewish people did not know the Bible, as I told you Sunday. And they certainly did not believe that Jesus was the Messiah. And the whole weight of the gospel stands on that. Is Jesus the Messiah or is he not? Our Father, we call upon you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for your precious word. We ask you, Father, to cause us just to believe you even when our minds cannot grasp it, with our hearts we can trust you because we know that the God of all the earth shall do right. We know that you are righteous. We know that those who want to be saved may be saved and that those who reject you, reject you unto their own damnation. We thank you for illuminating us. We thank you for our great salvation. Help us to be zealous in being a witness to others and being students of your word and encouraging one another. As the days grow darker, our hope grows brighter. For now is our salvation nearer than when we first believed. Through Christ our Lord we pray 